recording. So also welcome everyone on uh, on Moodle if you're watching or if you're not able to watch this live. So um, welcome, welcome. Um, today we will have a guest speaker like I just said to the other people that are watching it live. Um, Misha will be talking. Um, so the lecture today I shortened it a little bit but I hope that all of the points come across. Um, so it, it will be fine. It will be fine. Um, and I hope we won't run into many technical issues. So stream will start soon. Nope we already started all right so this is this is mess up number one i opened up the wrong powerpoint oh my god all right that's that's the first delay that we run into uh let me see we're lecture number five now right so um bloop no that's the wrong button that's the wrong button don't get nervous just just be cool be cool be cool yeah stream will start soon no we already started all right so today um, yeah so unprofessional I know I know I know I'm not a professional streamer although I do get paid for it so that makes me kind of professional right um, but Today we will be talking about plots, plots, and more plots, and this fits in really nicely with our guest speaker team, so um, let's just start. Um, I'm really excited. Before we start, I wanted to make an announcement because I mailed the Prüfungsbüro and the exam date is still unknown, but um, since last year also lecture number five had the information about the exam, I, I do want to notify you guys on what you need um, so you will be required to have a webcam you will be required to have some audio uh, a quiet room um, that's the most important thing uh, a mobile phone to take a photo and pen and paper so the way that we are going to do it is that there will be a form that you have to agree to online examination and that will be mailed to you you sign it and you send that form back to me via physical mail um, so I will probably just put the form on Moodle um, which is probably the easiest so um, the way that it works I put the exam questions on Moodle and they will be hidden and then when the exam starts um, we will have a zoom meeting so everyone who wants to do the exam will join the zoom meeting and then um, you show your student ID um, if everyone has their student ID and I can validate that you are who you say you are which is always difficult online um, but um, then we will open up the exam questions and the idea is, is that you just write the exam on paper um, I will monitor you during the exam um, and of course you have to keep your webcam and your audio open so I know that you're not sneakily having someone in the back of your camera giving you the answers um, and then, of course, after the exam is done, you photograph the pieces of paper that you used and you send me an email before the deadline. So, of course, the I don't know exactly how long the exam will be, but that's something that I still have to discuss with the Prüfungsbüro. Um, you send in the photos and then, of course, you also have to send in the physical exam via paper. And that's just because it's Germany, so I have to have the physical exams in my hands before I can give you a grade. Um, and this has worked out really well, like last year and also um, in the winter semester. So that's how we will do it. Um, and that's the way that it goes. And of course, when I know the exam date, when they are finalized, I will tell you guys. Um, we might also want to do a poll on when, because I hate making re-exams. So it would be good that if you, I, I, I will think about it. I, I will think about making a poll on Moodle so that people can vote. So we, we have the most people on a single day. All right, some general remarks. Um, I already uh, uh, mentioned this in the email that I sent around because we moved, but um, please attend the Zoom meetings. Even if you have no questions, it's always good to hear what questions other people have. So you can always learn from that. Um, and of course, ask questions as many as, uh, as much as possible. And of course, send me an email if you are running into any problems while you're doing the assignments. Um, of course, try them first, but if you get stuck and um, then send me send me an email just with a question um, and I think people are not using this option enough um, but like 
it could be that the assignments are way too easy, um, but then also let me know. If you're saying that, well, the assignments that we have there, like I'm finished with them in like 15 minutes, then that's also good feedback for me um, that I should just put in some additional harder questions. Um, also, if you take like five hours to do them, also let me know, right? Because it's feedback for me and I can just, it just helps me make the course better for next year or um, yeah, so it, every feedback is appreciated. Um, I wanted to mention that there's more assignments uh, available um, if you want to practice more because um, I know that from experience that people only become good at programming by practicing so you should practice a lot um, and if you want more assignments then there's no issue we can we can have more um, more assignments. I can make more assignments for you guys um, and that will be like good because practicing more means that you just become a better programmer quicker. All right so off to the lecture. Um, five minutes. Good. All right so I will be giving you uh, an introduction into plotting in R and I will try and explain to you what the difference is between S3 and S4 objects and how they relate to plotting um, and how you can um, create functions um, or functions and objects um, that auto plot, right? Um, if you have a matrix and you do image on a matrix, um, then R figures out what to plot. Um, but you can also create your own functions that are custom plotting functions for your own types. Right? In R you can define your own type and you can put types of data together um, and then once R recognizes that you have given it these types of data um, then it can call a custom plot function to make like nifty plots which are not possible generally. Um, and of course we will be talking about some custom plots like points, like scatter plots. Um, the thing that I always like to introduced to people is chromosome plots. Um, since we're working in biology we often have the chromosome as the thing that anchors our information, right? So if you're talking about genes or you're talking about proteins or microRNAs or all of these kinds of things, they all come with a genomic location, which means that when you plot them um, there is the, the chromosomes or the thing that we, that we anchor all of our plots on. Um, I will talk a little bit about circle plots and about colors um, and that's that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, in R, objects that you create um, are called S language objects. So if you just create a variable then this variable has a type, right? And we talked about types a lot, so you have numeric, logical, character and these kinds of types, but you can also come up with your own type. Right, so um, we can set up custom classes and we th this doesn't just hold for the plot functions, it also holds for the um, print and uh, summary functions. So the print and summary functions are functions that are calls when it detects a certain kind of object. And ha um, using the class R knows which function to call, so in, in during the entire lecture we will use my object um, as the name of the class that we are going to define. Um, so hey, you can use or you can define common functions. So let's just first make a simple object. So here we are making an object and this object is a list. Um, so the basic type of the object is list um, and um, the list in our case contains um, on the first position something called CHR which stands for chromosome um, and in this case um, there's two things in there so you have um, element 1 or something with the name 1 which has 15 stored into it and you have something with the name 2 which has 10 stored into it. And then on the second position in this list we have something called genotypes um, and genotypes is something that as a geneticist you use a lot so it's things like uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or Lycor markers or other things um, but in this case I'm just creating a matrix at the second position of the list um, and I put in 250 random numbers which I round down and it's going to have 10 rows and 25 columns. So I think everyone is by now familiar with how to create a matrix and this is just if I would if I would do this and I store it in my object um, then now of course R doesn't know that this is a special kind of object, right? I could make not just one thing but I could make like 10 of them um, which have all got a list on the first position there's something called CHR, on the second position there's something called genotype. So the thing that we're going to do to make it really 
an object, right? So that R also understands that it's an object is we're just going to say that the class of my object is a, a vector which contains a list, of course, because we don't want to lose the list functions, right? Because a lot of built-in functions are already in R, which work on lists. Um, but we are going to add a second class and this is called my class. Right, so I'm, I now have an object called my object, which has a secondary class, which is called my class, next to the class that it already had, which is the class list. And now when I type my object, of course, it will just use the standard list print function, right? Because it looks for a function called print.list and it finds that and it also looks for something called print.myobject and it doesn't find that so it reverts to using the first thing that it found instead of using the overriding class. So it will just use the standard list printing functions and then it will look like something like this so chromosome um, with 1 and 2 and it contains 15 and 10 and then we have the genotypes yeah, but then on the bottom it will print something and it will say that the attribute of this object is class so it has an additional hidden attribute um, and that means that it's a list but that it's also of type my class. So now if we want to, because normally if you would store like genetic data and you have like hundreds of thousands of single nucleotide polymorphisms on 600,000 animals for example or on, on 10,000 animals then just using the list print function um, it will just continuously roll down your screen and it will take a long time for R to print all of the data which is inside of this object. So what we can do is we can make a custom print function. So we define a function which is called print.myclass and this is the, the, the definition that the function should have, right? So it's a variadic function definition like we talked about in the function sections. And so it means that this function gets something which is x, which it has to be. Um, Denny Shelley, you sound very nice in English. Thank you, thank you. I, I talk English a lot, so um, I hope that it's understandable um, and that I don't have too much of a Dutch accent. Uh, doesn't shine through. Um, but the, it creates, so you create a function which gets an object called x and then you have the variadic argument which is called dot dot dot. So these dot dot dots means that you can pass more parameters to the function. So in this function uh, I define a custom printing so every time that I want uh, that, that something that has the type my class gets um, typed into R I want this custom print function to be called and I want the custom print function to print out that it is a my class object and then a new line and then it just prints the content but in a very very kind of summarized way right so the way that it does that um, is I summarize x chromosome so I had the, the thing that I put in chr is the number of, of markers that I had um, and then the th there's a second content right because it has the list has two elements and the second element is the genotypes and I'm just going to now say n row of x genotypes. So now when I type my object it will find the print.list function but it will also find the print.myclass function and since the print.myclass function is more specialized than the print.list function it will now use this printing function that we just made and it will just print my class object content 25 markers content 10 individuals right so the, the, the it's not going to scroll down the screen and hey, even if we would put in a genotype matrix which has a hundred thousand rows it would have a printing um, which is only three lines so you can't really overload R anymore and this of course is something that when you start writing code for other people is really useful um, because you can get like a summary of your main object um, so a lot of packages use this to define custom objects of course we can also overload the plot function right because if I would say plot my object um, then it will error out because it does not know how to plot this object right there's no standard way to plot a list in R um, but what we can do is again we can define an overload of the plot function so I'm saying plot.myclass is a function and again it takes the same input so it takes x comma and x is the object that 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 has the class of course and then it's again dot 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 for the variadic arguments and in this case um, what I want is that when something someone calls plot of my object I want an image to appear um, and this image has to be made of the second second element which is stored in my object so in that it, it, that's the thing that we call genotypes and then um, I'm taking the dot dot dots and I'm giving them to the image function 
So that means that when people plot the object like this, saying plot my object, it will make this plotting window, but because of the dot dot dots, if they want to change the color, they still can, right? Because the, the color argument, uh, you can add it, so you can say plot my object, comma, uh, comma color is gray, white, or something, and then of course it will use the colors that the user supplied. Um, so that's that's the way that you do it. And I use the box function because normally when you use the image function, then it won't plot the black lines on the top and on the on the right side. Um, so I, I just say box to to put a box around it. And of course you can make very nice looking custom functions. And this is just a way of showing you guys that it's possible to do this. We can also overload the image function, of course. Um, and so if I would say image my object, again, image does not know how to make a, a graphic of, of a list. Um, so again, we could make the same overload that we did before and now call it image.myClass. Then now when I do image afterwards, it won't produce an error, but it will just call my custom plotting function and show the user the same picture as before. So the philosophy behind R's plotting and plotting in R is that it uses the artist's palette model, right? And that means that you start up with a blank canvas and you build up from there. It's like a, a painter um, looking at a scene, right? So the first thing that the painter does is you take an empty canvas and then you, you paint the background. Right. Um, every I think everyone's seen Bob Ross and the way that Bob Ross does it is it takes the big brush, right? And then you make it like blue where you want the sky to be and then you take like green and you, you color the stuff green. And the same thing works in, works in R, right? So you start off with a plot function to create kind of an empty plot um, and then you use like, um, like you plot the data on top of it and then you can use things like annotation functions um, to modify or add to the plot. But the thing is, is that once it's on the canvas, you can't easily remove it and you have to then start over, right? And that's the same thing as that an artist work uh, works. And um, so what what they do is they, they just paint from the background to the foreground. And that's also how R works. So everything that you plot will be on top of the thing that is already there. And of course the annotation functions like text and lines and points and the axis, and these are just things to make your plots look a little bit nicer and a little bit better. And in my mind, this is very convenient because it thinks how most people think about building plots and analyzing data, right? Because you want to, um, for example, show first your data that you measured on body weight, and then you want to overlay. So in the same plot, you want to add, for example, BMI measurements. Um, the drawback, of course, is that you can't go back once a plot has started. Um, and so you can't adjust the margins later on. You have to make sure that the margins are proper to begin with. Um, and the problem there is, is that it's um, difficult to translate once another new plot has been created. So it's not a really graphical language. And a plot in R is just a series of R commands, which start with making an empty window and then adding one by one to it. And this is very different from the philosophy that, for example, is done in ggplot2. So ggplot2 is a plot package in R which is used a lot by a lot of people and it has a, a bunch of beautiful plots. Um, but here the plot is not built up from the back to the front. No, you kind of have a command and then another command and another command. And these are more or less added together to create one plot. So you can kind of take parts out and you can put parts in. Um, and it's, it's just a different philosophy when you use ggplot compared to the basic R plotting routines that you have. Um, but during this lecture we will focus on the basic R plotting routines and it might be that I can convince Paula to give you a ggplot2 lecture um, in case that there's a lot of people that want to learn how to use ggplot2. Um, and I can't teach you that because it's not the way that my mind works. I'm really stuck with this artist palette model and the way that I make plots is different from how other people might do it. Um, but I just want to show you guys during this lecture the way that I do it. Um, and if there's a lot of animo for it, then um, we can have a ggplot2 lecture as well. Although we are running kind of short on lectures, but we'll have to see how it works out in the end. 
So a very, very small example. Um, for example, we load the library data sets, which has a whole bunch of nice data sets for us. Um, and then we load the data into R using the data cars. So we are looking at a car data frame and this, this data or this data for cars, um, it has um, um, it has like things, it has all kinds of different cars in there, the make, the model, um, but things like also the speed, the maximum distance that it can travel on a single tank. It has the fuel usage and these kinds of things in there. Um, so here I want to introduce you to the with function. Um, so the with function allows you to take a matrix and what it then does is if you say with matrix, then in the second part of the with statement, you can use any column directly by name. So that's why I can say plot speed comma distance because speed is a column in the matrix cars and dist is also a column in the matrix cars, right? So the with function, what it does, it takes a matrix and then within the with function, it allows you to use directly the column name. So you don't have to say cars dollar speed or cars square bracket open comma between like air quotes, speed, close the square bracket. Um, so it's just a convenience function which allows you to very quickly um, address columns in a matrix. And of course, this is what R produces. Um, of course, this is a very ugly plot. However, it's for first data analysis, this plot is really good, right? Because you can see that, well, there is a relationship to the speed of the car and kind of the maximum distance that it can travel on a on a single kind of tank of gas. So some of the important parameters when you're plotting um, and we've already seen some of these um, but many basic plotting functions in R they share a very limited set of parameters and some of them that that we might have already seen but I just wanted to introduce them again are things like PCH. So PCH stands for the plotting symbol or the plotting character, that's how I always remember it, so P care, uh, P character, um, and this is the plotting symbol. And the default, like you've seen, is just an open circle. Um, and you can you can say PCH equals one, equals two, or equals three, um, but you also can give it a character. So if you wanna use like the letter A, um, you can. So you can say PCH is, and then you just have like the double quotes, and then you have the letter A in there and then it uses the A as the plotting symbol. If you are doing a line plot, you can specify the LTI, which is the line type. Um, and the default here is a solid line, but it can be dash, dotted, dash, dotted. Um, so you have like seven or eight different line types that you can choose from. And these you can all only specify using integer, so one, two, three, four. We have LWD, which is the line width, and of course this is when you want to kind of make one line much brighter than the other ones or much fatter than the other ones. So hey, and it's again specified as an integer multiple. So a line y, a line width of 1 is the same as 1.2, is the same as 1.3, um, but then when you go to a line width of 2, then it's double the size. So it's, it's always in kind of a point type. So you can't specify 1.5 as the line width. Um, the line width has to be either 1 or 2 or 3, so it have to, has to be whole numbers. Call stands for the plotting color. So you specify a number, a string, or you can do a hex code. And if you want to know uh, which colors are available, um, then you can do colors um, and just call colors without nothing in there. So you just call the colors function. And then it gives you a vector of all the colors that there are in R and the ones which are named. Because colors have names as well, right? So you can say color equals um, double quote open, blue double quote close, and that that's just the blue color, um, but you could also specify the blue color by saying um, color ish between quotes hashtag 0000 FF, right? So in RGB colors. Um, so there's many ways to specify colors and there's even more beautiful colors if you use, for example, the color, um, color brewer package. Um, but the default colors, you can list them all using colors. Um, also, you can Google it. So there's enough like images out there which show all of the different R colors with their names. XLOP stands for the label on the X axis and YLOP stands for the character string which is put on the Y axis. So these are, um, so these are um, 
parameters to the function that you are using. So you can say plot dataset comma PCH is five. The par function allows you to set global graphical parameters. And during the assignments, we already discussed it a little bit because the assignments were making some plots um, and they affect all of the plots in an R session. And these parameters can be overridden with specific arguments to specify plotting functions. So these kind of go um, beyond the standard plot function because they don't apply to a single plot, but they apply to multiple plots that you will be making during the same session. Um, so LAS is the orientation of the axis label on the plot. So an LAS of 1 means that it's horizontal to the axis and an LAS of 2 means that it's, the, that it's rotated 90 degrees. Um, you can set the background color of the plot. Um, this is especially useful when you're making plots that you want to use in a PowerPoint presentation because then you generally want the background not to be white but you want the background to be transparent so that you can have something in the plot or behind the plot, um, but you can set any background color that you want. You have MAR, which is the margin size, and this is the margin size within the plot. And then you have the OMA, which is the outer margin size, uh, which is the size outside of the plot. Um, so the, the And this has to do with the fact that you can have multiple plots next to each other. So if you have two plots next to each other, then you have a MAR, which is how far the plot is from the theoretical window. And then the OMA is the size which is between the two different plots. Um, but these are just parameters that you have to play around with to make nice plots. Um, we have already seen MF row and MF call, which is the number of plots per rows or columns. Um, and plots are filled row wise. And here you have the number of plots per row and then plots are filled column wise. And again here, I always mess it up, so I say MF row 1, 2, and then I actually meant MF row 2, 1. Um, but hey, of course, R is good at fast prototyping, so you can just change it whenever you need. You can also get the current settings. So you can use the par function to, for example, get the current line type. So if you say par LTI, it tells you that the line type standard is solid or is currently set to solid because you can change it, of course. Um, the the default color for plotting is always black. The default PCH is one, which is the open circle. Uh, the par of the background is white, because normally you have a white background when you plot. Uh, the standard margins are 5.1 on the, on the bottom. Do you need to set each parameter individually? Um, you need to override them individually. All of them have a default value, right? So the background color defaults to white. So if you want to have a different background color, you just have to say par background is blue, and then you get a blue background. You can use the par function, and the par function is a variadic function, so you can specify multiple at the same time. So you can say par background is white, uh, LTI is dotted, um, color is blue. So you, you can stack them all in like one call. Um, so you, you only have to do one par call to change like five or ten parameters. Um, so you can do that. Um, you don't have to kind of do par background is blue, then par mar is. So you can specify multiple in a, in a single go. Um, so you can get them um, and you can also set them of course um, and we will see how to set them in the rest of the examples. Alright, so the basic plotting functions in R is the plot function, of course, and the plot function makes a scatter plot. So it uses like the, the data that you give it to make a scatter plot. Um, so it has an X and a Y component, so it expects you to give it two vectors. Um, so you make a scatter plot or a plot, or a, but you can also specify the type. So you can use plot to make like a dot plot, so with, with points, uh, but you can also make like lines in the plot directly by saying type equals lines. If you want to add lines to a plot, then you can use the lines function. So hey, imagine that I have a plot and I want to highlight something or I want to put a line through the plot somewhere, then I can just use the lines function. Um, and the lines function adds a line to the plot and you give it a vector of x values and the corresponding vector of y values. Um, or you can specify this using a two column matrix where the first column is the x and the second column is the y. And had the function here just connects the dots and makes a line through all of the different dots. Points is used to add points to a plot. Um, you can use text to add a text label to a plot and you can then specify the X and Y coordinates. Um, so imagine here in the car example that we have, if I want to put the name of this car there, I can use the text function and say put a text at like 1040 and then put the text here. And then it will use that as the x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and then it will just 
start the text there. So it's not the middle of the text, but it's the beginning of the text string that you give it. Uh, the title is the annotation to the X, the Y, um, uh, the labels, the subtitles and the outer margins and you can use title for that. So if you want to plot not inside of the plot window but you want to plot something outside on the top, on the left or on the right or on the bottom, then you use title. Um, M text can be used to add arbitrary text to the margins, so inside the inner margins and inside the outer margins of a plot. Um, and title cannot plot, so the title and the M text is slightly different because the title always um, works um, in the, in, on the outside of the plot, but the M text can also be used to plot across. Um, so it's not used a lot, but I just wanted to show you guys. Um, the axis is for adding axis ticks and labels. Um, I think during the assignments or during the discussion of the assignments, I showed how to use the axis um, by putting bird is the word on different parts of the axis. Um, all right, so for things like heat maps, we want to generally use color ranges. So not just a single color, but like a nice range. Um, so there are different built-in color ranges. So R has like five built-in color ranges. Um, so the rainbow colors, of course, go from red to yellow to green to blue to kind of purplish and back to red. So it's kind of a, it wraps around. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, it, it's kind of a circle, right? Because the, the highest color is the same as the lowest color. Um, so it really has no real um, beginning and end. Uh, generally for heat maps, you use heat dot colors, um, which go from red on the lower part to white on the top part. And generally, if you take heat colors, you want to flip them around because generally you want to have the, the low values be white and the high values be red. And the default value is the other way around, um, but you can just flip them um, by using the ref function to reverse the colors. You have terrain dot colors, which gives you terrain colors, which goes from like really nice green all the way up to white um, and it's brownish in the middle. Um, and this is used when you make topographical maps, right? Because the, the zero level is generally the ground level. So there's grass growing there. And then the higher you get up the mountain, uh, the more kind of grayish brownish it gets until you get to the top of the mountain and the top of the mountain gen generally tends to be whitish. You have topo colors, which are more like topographical colors, and this adds, it's very similar to the terrain colors, but it just adds a blue um, area for things like sea level, right? So you start off like underwater and then you get near, near the surface and then you have the green grass and then you have like a little bit of yellowish for like the, the sunset and then it goes up. Um, and the ones that I like a lot is the CM dot colors. And I just like it because it's like bluish with a little bit of pinkish and it's white in the middle, which is also really nice. So the CM dot colors are really nice when you do things with correlations, right? Because correlations on the minimum scale range from minus one to positive one and in correlations, you're generally interested in the extreme values and not in the correlations that are around zero. So CM dot colors, I find it really useful or really beautiful to use them for uh, for correlations. Um, if I'm plotting a correlation matrix. Another handy color function that um, that you can use is gray. Um, it's not a range, but um, you can get a specific gray tone. So if you want to say gray 0 0.1, it gives you a color which is 10% gray. If you say gray 0 0.5, it's 50% gray and gray 0 0.9 is 90% gray. So it's, it's almost black, uh, but it, it's useful when you want to use gray tones. Um, and for example, you don't want to pay for color figures in a publication. Of course, we can also add transparency to our plots. Um, so here you see two, um, two histograms, right, that are plotted on top of each other. Um, and if you use the color, then you can define a color using the RGB function. You have to give the, the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel. But if you use the RGB function, you can also give the alpha. So the alpha is how transparent something is, right? So Normally, if I would plot these two, right, and I would set the alpha to one, then the red one would be completely intransparent. So you would not be able to see kind of this green part here, right? So that where the green one goes behind the red one. Um, but by setting the alpha to 0 0.8 or to 0 0.4 or 0 0.2, you can see that it becomes more clear and you can see the one distribution which is behind the other one. So you can use alpha colors as well to make things kind of which 
things which overlap still be visible um, to the, the pe person who's looking at your plot. There's a lot more colors in R um, and if you really want to have like really high quality good looking professional type of plots um, then you can use the R color brewer package and it defines three different sets of colors. So you have the, the quantitative set which is very good for doing quantitative data so data which has a range which is for example between 0 and 100 um, then you have the linear data which is very good when you're doing dealing with linear data sets so linear data sets means that you have kind of a uh, so the quantitative colors are really good um, when you do um, normal distributions the linear colors are really good when your distribution is kind of a uniform distribution and then the divergent one is the one which I use a lot um, and that is is because they have like the most contrast between. Um, so hey, here there's some examples of sets um, which are I think these are all divergent sets um, and you can see here for example that you have paired so you have first blue so kind of light blue dark blue light green dark green and these colors have been chosen for kind of the maximum difference in contrast. So if you have data which is very close to each other um, but you still want to show the difference uh, then you can use these diverging sets. Um, there are many many here um, so these are just a couple of examples of sets that you have um, but if you install the color brewer package then you can load it using the library function and then you can say brewer.pal and the n here is the numbers of colors that you want to take from the set um, so sets kind of generally have um, between 7 to 12 unique colors that are especially chosen for a certain property. Um, so you also have sets for people who are colorblind. For example, if you know that like I'm going to present for 200 people, um, then half of those people will be male and out of those like 10% will be red, green, colorblind, right? So you, you want to kind of then make your plot in such a way that you are not making people who are colorblind just kind of look and guess. Um, hey, but what you can do is you can say brewer.pal then you specify the number of colors that you need so you might need three colors or you might need seven colors um, and then you say palette name and palette name is for example I want to select from the accent colors uh, or I want to select from set one or pastel two. Um, and then you just store the colors in a variable called my color and then you can use it to select from them. They have many, many different ones. So this is actually the quantitative sets. These are the linear sets. So the linear sets go from one color to another color and they have like colors in between. So they are chosen for kind of maximum contrast in this sense. Um, and we also have the divergent colors, uh, which generally tend to have like a, a middle color. Um, and they are very good when you have data which has positive and negative values. So they, they show the most difference. So you, for example, have the, bla uh, the brown, blue, green one, and this is white in the middle. So again, all of these are really good when you are dealing with data, like correlation matrices, um, which generally tend to range from minus one to positive one. Um, and the spectral set is one that I also use a lot because I, I just like the, the look of it. What if you need more than nine colors? For example, the, the blues, um, is it in here? Yeah, so you have the greens, the oranges, and you have the purples, and there's also blues. Um, and the blue colors only has like seven or nine colors in there. So if you need more than nine, what do you do? Because it might be that you want to have like 50 colors or 100, right? Or you want to have a very, very smooth transition. Um, so if you just take the nine blue colors that are specified and you would plot them, then it would look like this. So there's no real gradient um, that you can make with them. But what you can do is you, when, you, when you store your palette, you can use this palette in the color ramp palette function. So the color ramp palette function takes a palette and then you can say, extend this to a hundred unique colors. So then it will take all of these colors and it will interpolate colors in the middle. And then when you plot it, so here we just plot from zero to 10 or from zero to nine. And here we also plot from zero to nine, but you can see that here you have a really nice gradient transition. Um, so this is really nice if you want to have um, very nice looking or very smooth looking um, heat maps or, or images. 
All right, so the width function, I already talked about it a little bit, it is a convenience function. It turns the columns of a data frames into variables, and that is why the read table has to check names, right? Because if you read in a table, right, then R demands that the column names follow a certain structure, like a column name is not allowed to start with a number. Um, and this is because of the width function. Because the width function, like I said, it takes a matrix and then it makes from every every column in the matrix, instead of having to select, for example, the ozone column from my data, I can just say with my data and then I can even define a block using these um, curly brackets and then within the block I can use the word ozone and then R will automatically know that it needs to take the ozone column from my data. So it saves you a lot of square brackets and floaty, floaty air quotes um, just using the with function. Um, and I will be using it a lot. So it's, it's a convenience function also during the assignments, use the with function. It will save you a lot of typing, it will save you a lot of square bracket frustration and strings um, which are not ended. So just a convenience function. So let me show you guys how I build up a plot. So for example, we look at the air quality data set. The air quality data set we already saw a couple of times, but it contains things like wind and ozone and temperature. Um, so I'm, I can say with air quality plot the wind on the x-axis, plot the ozone on the y-axis, and then give it a label saying ozone and wind in New York City. Um, and of course I made it a little bit smaller here, otherwise it doesn't fit the slide very well. Um, and then for example I can use the with function, right, so I can say with the subset of air quality where the month is 5, um, plot or take the points of wind and ozone and color them blue, right, so I use the subset function to take out a single month and then I use the points function to just make them blue in the plot. So you can barely see it here, right, on the, but this is the way that it comes out of R standard. So I just took R, did the plot, pasted it in, in here. But it's not a very good plot for a PowerPoint presentation, right? You can you can see that it that it's very hard to see this on the screen, unless you're looking at it on a like 60 inch monitor like I am, because then it's still pretty visible. But for normal people and on a Beamer, this would not be good enough. So let's kind of improve the plot step by step, right? Um, so the first thing that you do is adding a legend, right? So I add a legend on the top right. And the other thing that I did here is, is increase the contrast, right? Because if I have blue and I have black, these colors are very close together. So it's very difficult for people to see the difference. But the difference between blue and, and red is really clear for a lot of people. Even if you are like red, green, colorblind, you can still see the difference between red and blue. Um, so I'm saying here with the air quality, and the first thing that I'm doing is disabling the plotting of the points because I want to plot the points myself, right? So the thing that I'm doing is saying with air quality, plot the wind versus the ozone, add the legend, and then don't plot the points. So it doesn't plot the points to begin with. And then I'm going to manually plot the points. So I'm saying with, and now I'm subsetting the air quality for May, right? So the fifth month, and I'm going to say color these in blue. And with the air quality subset, when the month is not month number of five, so when it's not May, uh, plot the other ones in red. And then I add the legend, and on the legend I say, put it on the top right, use PCH is one because that's the points that we're using, give the colors blue and red and then the legend is May for blue and other months for red. Still the plot doesn't look that good but it's already better visible, right? Um, you can now see which points are blue and you can see which points are red, M more or less. So you can do a lot to still improve it, right? So we can make it more visible. So instead of using the um, default open circle, I plotted or I gave you a list here of all of the plotting symbols, the default plotting symbols in R. Um, so if you use a closed circle, which is uh, PCA uh, uh, 19, not 18, no 18 is the square, so PCA uh, 19, there's a little error on the slide, but PCA 19 is the closed circle, right? So you see that from going from open circles to closed circles, it already looks a little bit better. Right, you can you can more clearly see what's going on. So changing the point and making or using a different plotting symbol can make all of the difference in the world. Furthermore, since this is a PowerPoint presentation, I want 
dots to be very, very visible. So I just set the global parameter to, in, to increase everything. So I just say parameter CX, so the magnification, put it to 1.5, right? And you can see that the, the title changes, the title becomes bigger. You can see that the Y axis changes, it becomes bigger. And all of the points also become much, much more visible in the plot. So that's, that's already a lot better, right? You can now kind of see what's going on. Um, there's things that you can do now, right? You can also say, well, I want to highlight this point, right? So I want people that are looking at my presentation um, to see that this, this value here is a value that I think is important, right? Because I can say, well, I take an arrow and I have to manually figure out how to point the arrow, but in this case, the arrow starts at 3.4 here and it starts at 140 and the arrow points to 3.4 at 165 um, and then it points to this circle and of course I can give it any color but I decided to have an arrow here in a red color. One of the things that a lot of people want to show is that there's a relationship between the X and the Y. So there is actually a very, very easy way in R to add the best fit line, right? So the, the kind of more or less the regression line in a way, right? So what I can do is I can say I have a straight line, right? I want to draw a straight line through my data and the mathematical definition of a straight line saying Y, so the, the Y position of the line is A plus BX. So A is the intercept it means that it, it signifies the point at which the line crosses the x equals zero, right? Because if zero times b, this, this part of the equation becomes zero, and then you're only left with the a, so a is called the intercept, and b is the slope of the line, so it determines how quickly it drops or how quickly it rises. Um, so to find the a and the b parameter for my data set, what I can do is I can make a linear model, so I can say with the subset of the air quality data set where the month is five, um, then I can do a linear model. I model the ozone by the wind concentration, right? Because ozone is my Y and wind is my X. And now what I can just say is I, I can add this line to the plot by just saying AB line. So an AB line is a line which follows this AB structure. And I specify A being the first parameter of the model and B being the second parameter of the model. So the model contains a lot more. So the, the, the A and the B for the model are within the first list element. So I'm just saying model, take the first element from the list and then the first value in this vector, which is there, is the A component and the B component is the second one. Um, color it red which is wrong because month number five is blue. So this line should actually have been blue. Um, but And give it a line width of two so that it's more visible. Otherwise it would be very, very small. Right, so I can just add the best fit line and that's very easy to do in R. So question is, is are we done at this point with our plot? Um, well, not really um, because there's still a lot of things that we need to do. We still need to make the axis look beautiful, like the numbers here, they are facing the wrong way around, right? No one's going to do like this to read the plot. Um, there are no units, like is, is this wind in kilometers per second, miles per second, like light years per second? Same for the ozone concentration. The arrow needs to be defined in the legend because people need to know why there is an arrow. Can you delete the line of the legend? You mean the line around the legend, this one here? Yes. Yes, the legend function also has like a massive amount of parameters. Um, I think this is the uh, box. So you can say legend comma box is uh, false. Ooh, moderator, could you ban this P3NG? I do want to become famous, but I don't want to buy my followers. I'd rather have you guys just love me and show up because you like me a lot instead of just like buying them. All right, um, so the arrow needs to be in the legend. The line, the best regression line needs to be in the legend. Um, the legend might be a little bit smaller. You can see that there's a lot of white space here. And of course you can remove the line uh, from the legend as well. You can also make the background color of the legend a little bit different to make it stand out more. So we're not done yet, right? 
Um, I've been talking for 49 minutes, so I need to speed up a little bit to give Misha all the time that he wants. Um, but if I want to, for example, make multiple base plots, I can also use the with function, right? So I can say first, give me three, um, so make a parameter like MF row. So I want to have three plots next to each other. I want to have a margin and I want to have an outer margin because I want to have a little bit of space between them. Um, so I'm saying here the MF row is one, three, so three plots next to each other. The margins surrounding the plot should be four, four, two, and one. So this is four, four, this is two, and this is one. And then I'm specifying the OMA because I want every plot to have a little bit of extra space after it, because otherwise the legend here would be very stuck to the previous plot. So that is why the OMA is there and the margin is there. And then I'm going to say with air quality, and then now I'm going to define a big block because I want to do all three plots in one go. Um, and of course I can't do that in one statement, so I need to define a block using the curly brackets, just like we do in a, um, in a, uh, in, in a function. Um, and then within this whole block, I can just say plot the wind versus the ozone, plot the solar radiation, which is another column versus the ozone, and then plot the temperature versus the ozone, and then add an M text. Yeah, so the M text is here in the middle. Um, so I'm saying ozone and weather in the city of New York, outer is true, and it will automatically put it in the outer margin. Um, so here the two, the outer margin um, will, no, not the two here, but the outer margin will be used here. Um, so it will put a kind of title above the titles um, that I'm using. So the M text can be used to kind of put like a, an, another additional le legend or an additional like title or in the plot. Pie charts. One of these things that people love looking at and I think that they're really nice to make and they're really easy to make in R as well. So imagine that I have a pie chart and I want to add percentages to it. This is more or less the standard code that I use. So the slices are the size of the individual slices and they don't have to add up to 100. That's the nice thing about a pie chart in R because R will automatically scale them to 100%. So here I'm just going to say that there's uh, the US has 10, the UK has 12, Australia has 4, Germany has 16 and France has 8. I don't know what it is but just to have some values for our pie charts. So I define the sizes or the, the, the relative sizes that I want for each of the slices or the raw measurements that I have. Um, and then I'm just going to define something which is called labels, pie charts, delicious. Yeah, they are delicious. And they work really well. And like if you can present your data in a pie chart, you should present your data in a pie chart because people eat that shit up. And that's really true. So that's why pie charts are really nice. Um, so the nice thing is, is that you can, you can add the percentages to the le legends very easily um, because you can just say, calculate the percentages by saying, give, give me the slices, right? Divided by the sum of the slices times 100. So I'm going to calculate my own percentages and then round them down. Um, and round just means that I don't want like 16 digits behind the comma. Um, so then I'm going to change the labels that I have by saying paste to the labels the percentages and then paste to the labels that I had uh, the percentage and don't use a separator, right? So here it, it puts a space because paste puts, and here I could have just used paste zero. Um, so I'm just going to update my labels and then I'm just going to say pi slices, these are the labels that belong to it, um, use the rainbow colors and then do a main. So just a little bit of code. So the pie chart is made using the pie function and hey, you just provide it with slices and it will automatically scale them to 100% and you can just add the labels. And this is just like, hey, here we calculate the percentages and we just add that to the labels. You could have done this in one go, um, but I think it's clearer to do it like in three lines of code to show you that, well, we calculate the percentages, add it to the label and then add the percent sign after the label without using any separator. And then we use pi to plot it. So dendrograms are also used a lot. A dendrogram is a kind of a tree structure. Um, and um, for that, we need our data clustered, right? So I'm taking here the, the car data set, um, which I called empty cars because I, I removed or I, I removed a couple of columns which were not numeric. Um, and of course, we can only make dendrograms based on numeric data. It's the same as calculating correlation. You need numerical data. 
So here what we're saying is we're going to calculate a distance matrix based on the car matrix. So the first thing that it will do it is we'll, it will calculate for each car how far away from every other car it is. And then we're going to use the h plus function to make a clustering. And then we can just plot the clustering using uh, the plot function. And then it looks like this. Right, so it's it's very easy in R to make things like clustering plots, um, and the thing is, is that you have to remember that you use the distance function because the clustering function always needs to have a distance matrix and not a matrix of raw measurements. Uh, it needs a square matrix where every car is on the uh, on the on the columns and also every car is on the on the rows, and then for each entry in the matrix, it's how far away one car is from another car. If you want to pull all of the things to the same level, so if you want to put the, uh, the okay, because here you see that uh, the Maserata Bora is uh, kind of high up, um, if you just want to pull them all down and have the legends on the bottom, um, yeah, because you're working for example with animals and none of the animals are extinct, but you are calculating like the, the evolutionary distance, then you could use the uh, hang is minus one and then what it will do, it, it will just take the labels and put all of the labels at minus one. Um, so yeah, they, it, they, you want to have them at minus one and not at zero because otherwise they start overlapping with the lines and now you have a little bit of an additional space there. So hang is minus one, puts the labels all at the same level and, and kind of aligns them together. If you want to show some more fancy dendrograms, like this is called a, uh, a triangle way, right? So this is a standard dendrogram. This is a triangular dendrogram with a single origin. Um, you can just take your clustering object, right? So the cl object that you used and you used haclust on, then you can say as dendrogram, so I call it a ha plus dendrogram um, and then you have many more ways to plot them. So you can say plot this ha plus dendrogram, say type is triangle, then it looks like this um, and you can make it look cool. So this is just a bunch of code on a single slide, right? And I just put this here for you guys and I'm going to very quickly explain what it does um, because it kind of walks through the tree and then based on which group a certain thing belongs to, um, it colors the different different um, things so to make a ha plus dendrogram look cool because the the way that it looks here right it's it's not it's not beautiful like you want to use colors and had to kind of specify things um, but, but you can just get the code of the slide in case you ever need to cluster something or uh, you need to color a dendrogram so first you define the label color so I'm going to define four groups in my plot why four just because I want to have four groups, right? So I'm just going to take four colors. Then I'm going to say cluster members is cut the tree in four clusters. So you have cut tree. I take my clustering object and I just say four. Cut it into four groups, right? So it will it will go and have like a line going down the plot. And as soon as it plots or it it, it takes them or it makes them into four clusters, uh, then it will use this height at cutting the thing. And the thing is, is that you have this dender apply function, which you can apply to a dendrogram. And this function will just walk through the entire tree. And for each node of the tree, it will kind of run this function, which you provide it. So head to the clustering, provide this um, color label function that I wrote. So the color label function is a function which takes a node as input. So n is a node. So a, a point in the dendrogram. Um, the first thing that I need to do is ask if, if the node that we're looking at is a leaf node, yeah, are we on the bottom? Yeah, because this is a node as well, that is a node, that is a node. But in, the, in our case we want to color the leaf nodes, right? Because the leaf nodes are the ones that have the text in there. So um, if it is a leaf, get the attributes of this node and then I want to know using the class member func uh, class member cutting that I did in which of the four clusters this node falls. So I'm going to say class member which names class member is a dot label. So I'm just asking the question in which cluster does the label fall? Does it fall into the first, the second, the third or in the fourth cluster? Then I'm going to use the label colors and just going to select based on the cluster the color that I want and then I call this label color and then I have to set something which is called the node parameter. Um, so I'm going to say the attribute of n 
so the node that I got as an input, set the node parameter. And what do I want to set the node parameter to? Well, I want to set the node parameter to what it was, because I don't want to change everything. I just want to change one thing. And I'm going to add a label color. Um, so lab.color. And this is going to be the color that I just got from my label color. And then I close it and then I return the node. So I have to close the if statement because I want to return every node, not just the leaves. I also want to return the intermediate ones. So I can then just use the then apply function. And then huh, after I've, uh, I, so this, this thing will use this function that I made, apply it to every node in the dendrogram. And then I have a plus dendro or whatever you want to call it. And then I'm just going to plot this thing using the triangle function. And then it looks like this. So this already looks a lot cooler yeah, because now you can see that it kind of grouped the different groups together and gave it different colors. So a really kind of simple way to go through and just color the dendrograms. All right, um, I'm just going to stop the recording and take a little break and um, contact Misha. I have 15, 16 slides left. So it might be that after we come back from the break that I'm still talking um, for like 10 minutes, um, but then we will switch to Misha and he can tell you all about cool closed ecological systems um, and about plots and Arduinos and these kinds of things. So I will stop the recording.